All right, uh, dude. Okay, so Samir, we just went for a little walk outside, and I was I asked you about um, marketing and yeah. like how to be a marketing guru, and it's fascinating because you have kids and you have a wife and you have a life, and ha- and yet you are seen as an expert in pop culture, and I am out here in these streets, uh, marginally employed, <laughs> scrolling all day. And I feel like I am seeing the trends, the, the youth trends. I went to an open mic, and at this open mic, because um, I rarely go yeah. you know, at this point, but uh, it was all um, people under 25. And I was all the things that we've talked about, about like Gen Z and like um, millennial culture and TikTok trends. It's like I'm hearing that vernacular on the stage. And I feel like if I went in there with a notebook and just took notes, like anthropology style, you know, a gorilla in the mist. Oh yeah, I could, I could uh, come and pitch something at your at your job and get get gainfully employed. <laughs> so <clears throat> you're right. I mean, well, one of the things is what you do is you go to those spaces, you see this stuff, you hear people talking, and then what you do is you categorize what you heard. Right. So if it's a fashion trend, give it a name. You know how people called whatever normcore was normcore? Yeah. Well, that's what sells. It's packaging it in a catchy fucking phrase, and then advertising agencies buy it. And they put out these white papers of uh, Gen Z loves normcore or whatever. Yeah. They love cottagecore now, or cath tradcore. Uh, <laughs> oh, and by the way, you may have heard some giggles on the pod. As always, it's me, Gabe Pacheco, coming at you. Uh, and I'm always joined by the one and only Samir Nassim. But we have a special guest in the house today, a dreamer, my lover, a comrade <laughs> in arms, and a very uh, funny podcaster in her own right, the one and only Luisa Diaz. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. And thank you for having me, guys. As a listener, lover of halal cartels, I'm very excited to be here. Yeah, we're really excited to have you. <laughs> I thought you might get a kick out of this little anecdote, yeah. being um, an anthropologist as well. Um, just as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when did you get your degree? Huh? <laughs> as, a, as, as, an ar- ar- <laughs> as an armchair anthropologist. Uh-huh. Like- <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, me too. Because I don't do, um, I don't do, I don't write books about brown people. So that makes me a bad anthropologist, you guys. But instead, um, actually what I do a lot is, um, turn the anthropolog- anthropological lens on America and the West and white people and non-white people who live in the West and um, as a result, people don't love it <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, like uh, brown people didn't like it when there were white Europeans going to their places to write books about how these like savages eat this and believe that. And this is how their marriages are and whatever. Now you fucking this is how it feels. OK, <laughs> so like if you don't like my tweets and shit, this is how it feels. <laughs> you know what this makes me think of mm-hmm. very quickly is um, in Jurassic Park, you have the uh, master hunter who is dressed like a European colonialist yeah. safari guy. And he's got an accent. You know, it might be Australian. It might yeah. be South yeah. African. Yeah. But he, he uh, goes into the pit with the velociraptor yeah. and he's like, oh, and he realizes that the velociraptor has circled back around on him and mm-hmm. he's like clever girl right before he gets gutted gets killed yeah and that is what it's like when you use the weapons of anthropology and you turn those guns back on the whites yeah then they start having um <laughs> identity crises and start feeling attacked and feel like the whole world is ending suddenly when like it's like no um we're just letting you know how the rest of the world's been living buddy um but all of this to say that this connects to your, I mean, why I'm interested and so happy to be here. Um, I love the title of the pod. And then when I started listening to it, I really liked what you guys are doing. And I don't know if this is a case of like somebody coming to explain your your own project to you. (laughs) But also with podcasts, I find like um, a lot of times you start with an idea and then you see where it goes, right? And you let it develop. And you guys have actually really sharpened my impression of what halal cartels meant as you've gone along. Um, Because if we look at like uh, the term halal, it is a term that comes from a brown, mainly mostly non-Western culture. And it's a system of determining what in this dirty, bad world (laughs) is permissible. (laughs) Right. Yeah. And cartels is a brown, mostly brown system of, uh, circumventing the laws and policies that keep 
brown people down. So it's simultaneously this like um, asking for rules, accepting rules, accepting that there needs to be structure and, you know, some kind of cultural understanding, but it doesn't have to be the white hegemonic Western version. And that's where the cartels part comes in and tells you question everything, make your own systems. Everything that's illegal is not immoral. Um, and everything that is legal is not moral. What do you think? It's amazing. Bong. Uh, yeah, <laughs> literally. It's amazing. Like, nailed it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think and I like that you cover it from, like, uh, marketing, from comedy, as a teacher, as a dad. You know, you bring it up in so many different ways. And um, it's, uh, you know, a rhizomic pod, I think. I like it. Yeah, we, uh, we're, we're pretty chaotic. It's not linear. <laughs> Uh, but that it has been our relationship in comedy, Samir and, and mine throughout, you know, and uh, that is like the, I think the the best part of our two man hosting on stage. And this whole thing when we started it was, uh, I want us to have a pod where we are centering ourselves as what is normal and everything else is weird. Yeah. yeah. And that makes sense within the context of like turning the anthro lens yeah. back on uh, the hegemonic culture. Yeah. Is, like, you know, capitalist, totally. uh, post-industrial, uh, white New York City. Yeah, absolutely. No, and you even provide a good um, balance for each other, you know, um, in terms of walking more traditional paths of getting married and having a child versus being an eternal bachelor. Uh, so what did you call it? Partially employed? I don't know. <laughs> uh, artists do. I mean, you're also an artist, but there's two, those are two different ways that you are both going towards the same thing. Um, even though you may appear Samir to be like in a more traditional path within marketing, even I'm sure you work with a bunch of fucking white guys and rich people <laughs> and people that didn't live an experience like yours. So you're still othered there too, if I can speak for you, no? Yeah, for the most of my career. Yeah, and Gabe <laughs> is someone who then has worked in education and um, things with children and all of these like from your heart kind of bleeding heart career <laughs> choices. Soft boy careers. Yeah, soft boy careers um, that um, he is... Uh, Usually uh, it's a woman-dominated field, teaching, so I'm sure you were also othered and not white. And, you know, so it's like... I'm a always the alien in the teacher's lounge. Well, that's what I mean. So you both have a little halal and you both have a little cartels. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Outlaws. <laughs> that's amazing. Righteous yeah. outlaws. Yeah, exactly. So back to your anecdote, right, about these 25-year-olds and their... Fucking premises, dude. <laughs> no, I'm not here to actually get mad at the comedians for this. I just think that your um, anecdote is another um, symptom of something that I wanted to talk to you guys about. Yeah. Which is that um, on Twitter and online recently, there's been like a proliferation of these like right wing TikToks. And they are mostly young women who are making TikToks and Instagram videos and reels and whatever being like oh, we were tricked by feminism. We actually had it so good with being married and being taken care of. Uh, I traded it up for what? Being in a cubicle the whole day and having a cat. <laughs> and like the most horrible stereotype <laughs> of just like... I feel like that one hit close to home for you. <laughs> no, at all, because I yeah. did it on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> I did it, yeah, I didn't yeah. end up anywhere by mistake. And therefore, and that's my main thing is, yeah. um, you know, we'll get back to it. Is this that... Uh, and what makes it a halal cartel conversation for me? Because, uh, you know, I make a lot of jokes about trads, especially on Twitter and about marriage and having children. Um, obviously, it would be ridiculous to pretend like I think nobody should have children or nobody should ever partner up. Right. So it's not that um, my resistance or like my insistence on criticizing traditional forms of behavior, especially interpersonal relationships is because most of us enter into them without ever really critically thinking about what we want, what we want a relationship to look like, what we actually offer another person, what we need from another person in order to be happy. Like literally we teach our children, cause dude, uh, like, it makes me want to vomit every time I see like a toddler with a baby carriage. I'm like, how are, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> what are you fucking teaching this kid? That that's her whole future is to grow up and be a mom 
Dude, I'm sorry, but it makes a fucking difference. Like, you're giving boys, oh, outer space travel shit and fucking guns and like, oh, oh but then why do they shit? Whatever, we're not going there. My favorite toy, by <laughs> yeah. the way, was uh, it was like little plastic skeletons yeah. and then you would put Play-Doh uh, over it so yeah. it looked like a monster and then you would dip it in a vat of acid. And it would melt away. And it would melt away and you would just get the skeleton again. That's horrific. <laughs> <laughs> so they were raising me to be like a, a, like a, like a cartel hitman. Like yeah, cartel a, El Pozolero. Dormidas. They're like... <laughs> <laughs> Give the doormat. Yeah, they're oh, like. Why? I mean, if he doesn't, if he doesn't have like ambition, he can always do like uh, embalming some animals. What is it? Uh, animal. <laughs> do you know what a, rep- uh, a recession-proof job is? Funeral home operator <laughs> so one day i might have like four or five ortiz funeral homes you know what i mean i mean <laughs> dude that's better than like um you know i'll tell you why i was gonna i sometimes i get in trouble with my analogies being too dramatic so i'm gonna tr- i'm trying working on pulling them back okay but so uh the fact that gabe you were saying to samir that um you're seeing these young comics go up on stage and most of their material is about um, abuse, trauma, bad relationships, bad sex, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, beyond the comedy conversation that can be had about whether that's productive <laughs> in comedic sense, in a comedic sense, um, I want to talk about it in connection to this video of, this young, of these young women yeah. putting out these pro-trad things, which, yes, it's connected to right-wing shit who are paying probably people to do videos and whatever, but it's important that we understand why this is happening right now. Why young people are starting to think things like maybe it was better the way it was before. Mm-hmm. And it is because even leftist people who are like talking about how the government needs to change and provide more for us and we deserve better in the environment and schooling and safety, etc. We are mostly people who are aware of the public se- sector and how that needs to change for us to live better lives. But again, like the rhizomes of these podcasts, um, you can't attack a problem from one side only. Okay. Right. Uh, because what happens when you attack the problem from one side only is that you produce the current situation. Because what happened, I guess, with feminism, and not with feminism, but with society in the last 20, 30 years was that. Um, we got as far as like women asking for certain rights within marriage even and just as citizens but then we added this idea of like have it all right so we want everything that men get but we are also accepting that we need to be wives and mothers and housekeepers right and nurturers and all this so we are now in the workforce getting paid less than men for the same jobs and then returning home to do more than 90% of the work of raising children and caring for a home. That's right. Clean, sweeped floors. Do lasagna. homework. Lasagna. Yeah. I need the lasagna. I need, I'm Garfield. <laughs> <laughs> right. and, and not just that but if you're a privileged woman yeah then you're in a better situation because you can outsource your domestic work um Get even them nannies. the child care and even sometimes the childbirth right to women who are poor and in a less in a situation where they have even less choices than you have right so of course we now we are now seeing some people come to the conclusion that this didn't work <laughs> you know like uh, it is not good. People don't get paid enough. We Even people with two incomes in a household can, uh, struggle to get a house. They're seeing it doesn't work. And instead of seeing that the problem is that we never addressed the internal, the private sphere relationship to capitalism and how that affects our relationship to each other, means that we were only at, like attacking one side while the other side was like, oh, okay, honey, I'll make you dinner. <laughs> and like not changing at all from the 1950s. Yeah. Right. You know, what do you think so far? No, I completely agree with you. I mean, that is a reality. And that was witnessed by COVID where people were working from home. And now it became a thing where kids weren't going to school either. Yeah. So if you have a dual income house and it's like a hetero, like husband, wife kind of thing. And the wife wound up taking on the responsibility of the kids doing the school thing but also had the same pressures at work. So it was amplified. It wasn't just after. Yeah. It was during. And uh, I think that completely exists. And I think in that construct, nobody really talked about how is it that women are taking on all the home responsibilities? Like who made that fucking deal in the first place? Yeah, man. And how is that shit still around? Like Totally. And so this is what I'm saying. It's like the, the halal side of this is that, 
Uh, tradition has value. Um, love and partnership and having a family has value, obviously. But the cartel side of it is that we need to be questioning how we're doing these things and the systems that we're reifying and not just reifying in what we're choosing to do, but then teaching our fucking kids that shit. So they keep doing it. You get me? Well, it made me think about like the ideal of both anarchism and, and libertarians. Uh, the ideals that they that are espoused are kind of like, uh, what if we had freedom from all government restraint? And I think that when they think of government restraint, it is within the lens of like this feminism. Yeah. It's like, what if we had freedom from uh, being shackled to the home exactly. and being shackled to being married to someone uh, <laughs> for like sexual expression, for financial um, for just anything. Comfort yeah. and for like rep social replication, having kids. What if we had freedom from that? And then the answer has been cool. Here's freedom. Here's the free market. Yeah. And, and then just drown on the your freedom own. Yeah. of the free market. It will like, you know, the anarchists were incapable of uh, standing up to fascists in Spain. The um, they all fell apart because of that. Libertarians. Uh, once you give everyone freedom to have their own company. You just have like one giant octopus yeah. uh, consuming all the other companies. Yeah. And then the freedom from patriarchy without uh, <laughs> without putting something in its place yeah. just leads to um, more atomized women who exactly. have to do everything. Exactly. I mean, like, uh, you know, people love to say that socialism has never worked or whatever, but that's not true. It's failed ultimately because it doesn't work if it's not a global organization. Uh, because we're already a global society. We need each other and we can't trade with capitalists if we're not... Ca it's a, whatever, I'm not going to get into it. But the point is <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, that there have been um, huge strides made socially by so socialism before, right? And one of them is in this area of um, male-female relations and equality, okay? Um, in the Soviet Union, one of the things that they did before they were completely like... Um, I guess like embargoed to death <laughs> by the by the Europe and shit was um, they invested a bunch of money into what they called the woman's problem, right? Because <laughs> that's how they phrase things. <laughs> They're like, yeah, you know, <laughs> you know, you know the, the women's, women's problem. problem. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Which one? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, and God. so um, I just imagine Borat voiced like <laughs> Politburo guys being like, you know how the wives have the women's problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, you guys. We well, society has the women's problem, which is, yeah. um, you know, uh, well, this is actually what I was going to tell you is you. Know, Based on like what you were saying, I think a very similar comparison, this is going to sound kind of bad, <laughs> but um, is sort of something we were talking about before of like how directly after slavery, because there were no real structural systems or support put in place to support freeing slaves and giving them their own land and education yeah, right. and medicine, et no, cetera. No, uh, no uh, acres, uh, yeah. what is it? Six, 40 acres and a mule. There's no 40 acres and a mule. Nothing, no. And right. they were, dude, like literally with Juneteenth is like they didn't even fucking tell them that they <laughs> were free. That's the reason for okay? it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> They're so, like, it got, the news got to Galveston, Texas. A little late. A little sure, late, yeah. Sure. <laughs> exactly. Like fucking years. So after they were freed, slaves, you know, there are there is documentation, Gabe and I were talking about it, of slaves um, expressing like regret that they lost a kind master or, or a good situation where they were fed well and treated well by a family or where they were they got to be with their family because it was like a big farm or plantation or whatever. And now that sounds kind of like crazy that a, that a slave would be like, ah, oh, I didn't have it so bad. You know what I mean? Right. But literally, that's what some women are doing right now. And I know that it sounds crazy, but like you need to understand that less than like 100 years, like a oh, 100 years ago, marriage was slavery still. Sure. Women could be beaten and raped and imprisoned by their husbands because they were uh, their legal guardians, technically. And there was no way that a woman could file for divorce or get out of a fucking abusive relationship. Uh, divorce and custody laws favored the men. Women were not allowed to inherit or own property, so even if they inherited property, it went to their husband. Okay, uh, We couldn't open a credit card, a bank account of our own until 1974, I believe. So... I want Wow, that's after Woodstock, baby. Yeah, dude. That's after insane. Woodstock. That's after Altamont. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's it's after Martin Luther King. It's after it's a, it's late, yeah. dude. Yeah. And um so when 
you now see women being like, yay, I can't wait to get married. I'd love to get married. It does hit me wrong because of the fact that it is an ahistorical excitement that you're feeling that disregards the fact that for more than fucking almost a thousand years, marriage was a slavery institution for women that um, used them as chattel to exchange for uh, social climbing, to secure allegiances, to exchange land, to avoid getting murdered by a warlord, <laughs> to like literally it's like the best cow that you have yep. and I can trade her for good shit. That's what a fucking daughter's for. So for people nowadays to be like, oh, you know, it's such a beautiful thing. What exactly makes you think that like your version is so separated from this version that was like less than 20, 30 years ago? How? 1994? So then, you know, consider this. So like leftists, I think we're all leftists here. We understand that p the reason we need unions is because our health, our health coverage and our rights as workers and as labor should not be in the hands of a corporation, right? Yeah. I think it's the same thing with marriage and with, in, with interpersonal relationships. There needs to be education about what it entails, what it actually legally means for you, um, because it's for both sides that it's like people remain married because they can't afford to get divorced because they could lose family inheritance if they disappoint their whole family because they think it's a sin, <laughs> you know, like for all these reasons. So what I want people to like understand in their head is like, for the majority of history, women did not choose marriage. Okay. Your fucking options were you could maybe be a nun if you're lucky. You could go be a um, live in domestic worker or you could be a sex worker. And all of those things were things done out of desperation because that's how much you did not want to be married, all right? So for us to now pretend like it's all good and it's just like a fun little party and now it's equal, when in reality we know that currently it is not equal. Men and women are not splitting um, household labor and childcare labor evenly. And here's the thing for leftists, again, it benefits like, you know, we're always like, oh, but who's they that are doing things in the background to us or whatever, and it's not a they. It's a system that we put in place a long time ago called capitalism. And capitalism benefits from the continuing production of labor until it exhausts its resources completely, right? It is just a burnout system. Yeah. So it absolutely needs the continual production of laborers to add to the labor force. So babies. Exactly. exactly. But wait, which is not bad because we people want babies, right? Yeah. But the problem is that it's a trick. The nuclear family is a trick that tricked everyone into undertaking the labor, the time, and the monetary cost of producing a labor force for society who then does not provide that child with health care, education, protection, even like gun-free schools. <laughs> like nothing. <laughs> not even like, dude, a hundred years ago, babies were dying from drinking milk with chalk in it. People, I don't like... Just ask, right? So I want you to be cartels about this. Like you can be halal about some traditions that you want to keep and the things that you think are permissible and brought you joy in your life and that you want to pass on to your kids. But then you have to be cartel about the things that are bad and confront them and have real negotiating conversations with your partners about what you expect when you live together or when you have children together or why marriage is important to you. But most people are getting divorced or being really miserable because they're not having these conversations until after they get married. Yeah. Do you think in high school, along with like a home ec type class or a financial literacy class, a, a part of that component should be like, if you're going to get married, here's your marriage role play uh, seminar. <laughs> and you actually have to do like a T-chart and yeah. like figure out what you want out of a partnership like that and figure out the finances so that... Uh, once you once you start thinking about it, uh, you've already got your like battle plan in a laminated folder from high school. And yeah. then you can pull out and be like, look, I've already done the work. Exactly. Well, oh, so I just clarified something in my brain that I said wrong. So I was saying like, you know, I think we would all agree that jo our health care and stuff shouldn't be tied to our jobs. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, That's agreed. why we want universal health care, because you should be free to change a job, to move to another place, change careers and not be risking your whole life, right? It's the same thing with marriage and women. 
we should be providing the kind of social system where you are not trapped into marrying because it is the only way to afford a house or the only way to be able to have children or the only way to be able to have uh, health care or a green card. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like there's a lot of reasons that people get married that are not romantic or cute or fun. And I'm just like, let's talk about it. Because instead, we now have a whole young generation who is like, maybe we should go back to doing what grandma did. And it's like, yo, grandma did not have a happy life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like on the whole, for the most for part. For all of us, a very culture. Most people, <laughs> yeah, seriously. You're like, so what did you do for fun? And they're like, are you fucking playing? What is, yeah, fun. <laughs> what are you talking about? You mean when I was like three or like, what? Guess what toys existed? <laughs> a fucking hoop and a stick. Yeah. yeah. And you smacked it and ran around after the hoop. Yeah. Exactly. What did you do in your free time? I went out and, and gathered uh, cow manure patties yes. to, <laughs> to throw in the stove for a great grandmama. Quite well, literally. <laughs> I, agree, I agree with everything you're saying. So that's the whole thing, right? People love to lambast uh, capitalism on the whole but yeah. then pick and choose the elements of it that it's very much that halal cartel is like vibe like we're not all one thing i'm a, i'm not the anarchist guy who's like fuck it man it'll just yeah. all work out like i i realize exactly what you're saying i think it's transcending like what you said is like transcending for me because i was stuck in my own head about really what is this when i describe it to people uh i say it's a post apocalyptic almost <laughs> conversation right as though the apocalypse had already begun yeah or i say it's um you know post-colonial for sure yeah. exploration of pop culture and through the lens of the global south and but what you say is absolutely right when you dissect what this whole thing is about and the thing i was gonna say is you, it's what you said also is the whole point of marriage right nuclear family why do they incentivize you to mm -hmm. get married T filing jointly for the most part, is going to give you yeah. a favorable tax rate or tax break. Uh, and what happens when you have kids? You get a shitty, but yeah. some sort of reprieve or whatever. It doesn't actually, it's like credit card points Housing, where it's like, wait. Fuck. Housing crisis is also partially something used to uh, push people towards the nuclear family. Because mm -hmm. it, like literally, we all know in New York, people move in together fucking five years before they would in any other city because it's like, well, I spend my time here all the time anyway. Why should I pay rent? Yeah. But it's like, yeah, but I always clean before you come over. And I'm like, right. you don't know what it's actually like to live with me. <laughs> and it's right. fucking ridiculous. And they're like, I hate this person a year later. I'm like, God damn it. Uh, yeah. Do you see? Oh, so this is where I wanted uh, to tell you about the Soviet Union real yeah, quick. Yeah. Um, my last little anecdote or promise for the future based we, on the we past. We love it. I wrote it right here for you. Oh, thank you. The <laughs> Russian women. Yes. So uh, during the Soviet Union, right, the women's problem, uh, Lenin um, addressed it by providing a bunch of money um, for the women's, I guess, bureau or whatever they called it. And um, this included everything from training women for like every kind of career, like it opened all the jobs for women. Um, it included full state provided um, health care, child care, support through pregnancy. Um, and so what ended up happening during the years in the Soviet Union is that marriage rates did, like completely plummeted. OK. And the reason was because all of a sudden when women found themselves not needing men to have health insurance, to have a, enough money to pay rent, to have support system so that they could have a child, then all of a sudden they could have higher standards about who they want to spend their time with. You uh, get me? So then now it became a thing that like... So no weird uh, finance bro short exactly. king weirdos. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like oh, you, the women. Yeah, what are you going <laughs> to offer me? I... I I'm taken care of by the state and by myself and my own labor and I take care of my child and I don't need your whatever you're offering. So then uh, when the Soviet Union fell, an anthropologist went back and like visited a bunch of the countries, formerly Soviet countries, and did surveys with men and women who had lived during the Soviet Union and found across the board in all the Soviet nations that the women all reported being happier when the Soviet Union was up because they had support. And when it fell, all of a sudden they were back in the same situation of being widows and divorced and uh, dependent on men in all these other ways. Every, in every Soviet country, the men reported being happier. 
because now we get to go back to, I'm an ugly, uninteresting dude, but I have a BMW. Do you want to go home with me? And it comes back to a woman being like, yeah, you know what? I'm poor. I don't have an education. I don't have any other way to move out of this situation in my life. I'll marry the guy with the BMW. And then people are like, marriage is so romantic. (laughs) Right. Barf. Yeah. (coughs) Or like, I feel like uh, when uh, people even stigmatized like um, the, uh, what is, what was her name? Melania. Yeah. It's like, yo, I'm not a fan of Melania, but like, I understand Trump is, Trump is like a a gross billionaire. Yeah. Or like a pseudo billionaire. And he was just out like um, scouring Eastern Europe for, uh, for like trophy wives. Yes. In the post, um, uh, post uh, communist era. Yeah, they were all poor, and you got like yeah. poor hot ladies that mm-hmm. are like easy to snatch up. Um, yep. or, I mean, there was a whole industry, like yeah. mail order brides. Mail order brides, exactly. And, and that's who they target: nations where mm. people are. Like the Philippines has a huge mail order bride, uh, bride kind of situation going on. Mm. There are people who go there and look yeah. for. A lot of like the early ninety day fiance people were mm-hmm. doing that, like Thailand, yeah. Philippines, etc. It made me think, though, it's almost as though they were acknowledging that I'm it's a just a contract. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm the, gonna go buy a wife, kind yeah. of thing, which is so fucked up. Well, I hate the uh, ideology underneath ninety day fiance, the invisible ideology, like because we've game it's gamified and it's made to look like uh like there's a silver lining, like. You're going to live in the U.S. if you can yeah. make this work. But why should someone have to, a Mar- desperate person, mm-hmm. have to jump through the hoops and uh, marry like a no-necked weirdo? Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, and they couldn't, so get, real. they couldn't get love in their own culture. Yeah, like. yeah. It, it's uh, the same ugliness as like um, uh, sweepstakes. Because I remember in the 80s, it, like if you look at old footage of... Um, that where uh, where housewives would be able to put their shopping cart for like 15 minutes in a in a store and put everything they could in it mm-hmm. and then leave and you go you watch this and you go man what a dream to get whatever you want but then to think of the desperation required to ha- to like f- to normalize that type of behavior where like there's so much scarcity in your life that you have to run through this store and hoard as much stuff as possible yeah. Right. And but we've gamified. We made that look like a game too. And then they make you pay the taxes later <laughs> for all that. The oh, those gifts. Uh, oh, you have well, to pay the tax. And yeah. Then, yeah. Yeah. I and mean, for game shows, definitely. Yeah. Um, well, but that's the whole thing, right? This concept. The tr- going back to what you were saying, the trad, the return to trad, right? This happens across. <laughs> that's the name of the album. <laughs> it's it's pathetic. It's sad, and it's give up culture. Yeah. Uh, this is like a new generation of people. It's not all of them at all, and sure, there's a you know a chunk of people talking about this at the moment. And I agree with you. I think it is sponsored by the right wing, trying to get people to just say, "Well, we had it better before," but. The reality is people love being contrarians because that gets clicks and that gets comments yeah. and that, and that's how that stuff proliferates, especially. But on top of it, it's just people giving up. And yeah. And I can see both sides of it. I, I don't endorse them giving up, but I also see what you said. There's a vacuum. It's like Arab yeah. Spring. Arab Spring happened, but then what was there to replace it? Or it's like um, when the Shah got overthrown, uh, what came in power of the Shah yeah. or in place of the Shah. It wasn't what the people wanted. Afghanistan, for example, was a place that was really cool. and People were pretty liberal. And then the Taliban comes to power. And there you go. Like, yeah. And even in it's so in, it's interesting because when the Taliban came into power, they were initially very popular because in the aftermath of the Soviet Union leaving, the uh, Mujahideen warlords who were had fragmented the country and it was so chaotic and they were, they were like uh, extortionists in whatever areas they controlled. And the Taliban were basically like straight edge, hardcore kids right. who had come from madrasas in pa- Pakistan yep. and came over the border and were like, we're going to unify everyone under a ascetic uh, set of laws that are going to filter out this corruption. Mm-hmm. And so like, obviously things didn't turn out well with them. But, like, I can see the initial embrace that if you were living under a corrupt warlord that was extorting you every week mm-hmm. for, like, this group of dudes coming in, living, like, a like clean life mindset, 
uh, you would be down with that. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel bad because I meant to say sh- the shine or run, not, not yeah. a, yeah, but yeah. Well, to um, bring it back to where we started, which was uh, joke premises and, <laughs> and on- <laughs> online shit that makes you mad. Um, you know, some people get mad at my jokes about trads, right? And, you know, I get it because they think it's like they take it personally because they are perhaps married or excited about getting married or have always wanted to get married, for example. And they take it personally. Like I am uh, someone who recently said yucking their yum. (laughs) Um, But as an anthropologist, I'm really interested in the narratives that we internalize and that we contribute to and that we keep alive because we make them and yet we then become powerless to them. Like, oh, well, I can't do anything. This is just the type of guy I like. Oh, well, I can't do anything. This is, I just always wanted to get married. That's, I got taught since I had a baby doll when I was three, <laughs> whatever. So um, it matters what we say. And like the ideas that are circulating is why the right wing is probably paying people to put out these like pro trad shit, like videos out. Um, but we also have to see like, People will be like, oh, Lisa, why do you even care? Why be so committed to this? People who try to live differently continually get silenced. And it is our responsibility, all of us, to, like, for a better world, to encourage and elevate the voices that are trying to provide different ways of living. And in the last few months, I have seen there's a woman writer who just got off of Twitter because she started to write about how she recently had a son. And well, he's like two or three or something. And she started to tweet about how um, she didn't really enjoy being a mother. (laughs) 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 Yeah, 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 you laugh. But like the thing is, there's got to be many women out there and men that don't enjoy being a parent and they regret that they did this. But the only thing we ever hear is you're going to love it so much. It's the greatest thing in your life. It'll make life worth living. (laughs) Right. That's all we hear. And so fine. Maybe that is the, the experience of a lot of parents. Great, but people should also be hearing, you could regret this. This is what my daily life is like. You know, this woman used to tweet about, like, I used to be an artist who could spend all this time thinking about the things that I have to do, and instead every morning I have to have a conversation with a human that can't speak a full sentence, (laughs) you know? And she's like, and no lie, people on Twitter got so mad at her, Samir. Like, they were, like, replying to every one of her tweets, like, you're a horrible mother, you should kill yourself, what are you going to do when your son grows up and sees this? Dude, dude, just like completely projecting, like if it was their mom saying this about them. You get me? Like they just, took it personally. It, it, that's yeah. the whole shit that blows my mind. Yeah. Well, one thing for the listeners out there, like your podcast is called what? Why you mad? <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> and uh, so if you you are, don't already know, now you know. But that the, I want to start at one thing. So people who come after you, yeah, I've seen it actually. Um, I think I've even comment. I've I've um, engaged with some of them and been like, "You're fucking yeah. dumb as fuck." <laughs> but uh, um, but there is routinely like people yeah. coming for you on there. But it it's hilarious to me because I'm like, you are literally um, so insecure about what you're doing that someone else's opinion on it is yeah. making you question your reality and your response to that is rage and anger and you're you're bumming me out about my like uh plan well yeah. fucking if you're so steadfast sure and yeah. excited <laughs> about your plan <laughs> nothing anyone could say should ever deter you like That's you right. need to be a fucking mormon not, about this not just that well, it's literally like, the most beaten path buddy you're gonna be fine yeah. i mean you're gonna be doing the same thing your grandma did so you're fine and you were surrounded by people <laughs> who do this right yeah but there's so many things like marriage for example it's such pageantry and it's such a milestone moment where people mistake it for it's exactly what you said. They yeah. don't think about the long term effect. They think everyone's doing this. It's lemmings jumping off a cliff yeah. because the party is what they think about. They don't think about the eternity yeah. of being with someone else. And then the parenting thing is really wild because toxic positivity rules the parenting community, along I with bet. predatory, uh, blonde, fit women who what are. What if I had six socks, sock puppet handles <laughs> on these mommy blogs and I was the toxically positive? <laughs> <Yeah. reader>? <laughs> <laughs> Who's just like dra- driving people mad? <laughs> <laughs> no, the thing I think is it's yeah. exactly the differing point of view. So there's so many times this happens almost every day where 
I'm exhausted and it's only yeah. the evening time. I've just been dealing with my kids. I'm, I'm different because I'm very hands on, but I'm forced to be. I'm sure I would be kind of shit at this if we just had one kid. But because yeah. we have two, I just can't. You, I have ca- you to, can't. I have yeah, to be, you can't be lazy. Like <laughs> one for each. And that's still not enough people. Yeah. yeah. And um, so I'm just always with them and I'm yeah. hands on and I'm I'm in the thick of things. And I feel like that being said, I often go, wow, look at my life right now. And if I, I didn't really want this, I didn't even know I wanted it. When it happened, I was like, oh, shit. Well, here we go. But, you know, when it ha- when they were born, I was like, you know what? Fuck it. This is great. Yeah. I'm going to ride with this and yeah. figure it out. But. There are people who are not like who that are not, at all. Yeah. Like, I mean, I know people who find out they're having a kid and you know straight up by talking to them that they're in the Thunderdome and they're <laughs> like, oh, God. You know? And I just think of them and I'm like, yeah, no, I understand how babies get shaken to death yeah. and shit like that. Totally. Because they don't, they're just like, fuck, yeah. this is my life. And it's just a kid screaming yeah. constantly. Yeah. And so it's like, and I don't a endorse parenthood, parent. honestly. I'm, yeah. I will be the first person to be like, don't fucking ever do it unless you're you are down to have your life completely change. Yeah. And if it means that much to you, then go for it. If not, fuck, go get a dog. Do something else. The world is ending yeah. anyway. It's like, and there's definitely ways to do partnership and family and um, just do it conscientiously and like in a way that you have negotiated with your partner and that you've thought through the commitment and you know like there's nothing there is no downside to being more aware of what you are agreeing to or what you're wanting and desiring for yourself or your children you know that transcends even this right what you're agreeing to we live in a culture where we are constantly hit with a new privacy agreement over email or on an app in order to use that app. And it's an app that you kind of like need to use. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. Fuck, the train is down and I have to get home. Yeah. I need to use Uber. They're like, yeah. well, just one thing. We have a 72-page new user agreement. And so we're accustomed to giving up our rights, believing that whatever it was that was in the agreement we would was have reasonable. To. Yeah, exactly. I mean, of course, so, if this was like going to steal yeah. some of my fucking rights, I wouldn't sign on to this. Nobody would. This is, uh, I'm a huge states statist, I guess would yeah. be a word. Uh, my anarchist friends might call me a statist. <laughs> and uh, a big government boy. But this is... Um, to go back to kind of both your points as a parent and also uh, from as this trick. As a child free. Oh, okay. Yeah, but the trick, the trick that uh, women that have, has been played on women and the nuclear family yeah. is that like I think about it where you it, back in the day you had taxi drivers and they had a fleet of taxis and the taxi company. Let's pretend the taxi company is a kind of a metaphor in this as for the government and the government has made a trick where they've said you are now an Uber driver. Yeah. And it's your car and you're responsible for the maintenance mm-hmm. of your car. And that is what our children are within the concept of the nuclear family. Exactly. The government still needs, uh, they always say there is a population problem. There's a dip we're going to need to replenish our workforce. And our prison camp labor force. And our economy. <laughs> so for the economy and for uh, the growth of our weapons industry. And, and for, for fighting our wars. And for everyone, all the civil servants, we're going to need new people. So the government needs social capital, which is human resources, people. Mm -hmm. But instead of putting the money into saying we are going to invest in that, they're telling uh, parents to do that. And they're saying, put your kids in the best private schools. Make sure you deal with your kid's own dental. Make sure you deal with your kid's own therapist. And if they're anything less than perfect, that's a personal failing on you, parents. Yeah. And uh, so, like, every time there is a school shooting, Mm -hmm. this is, like, grim. But um, those were all investments that the – especially if it's at a public school, those were all investments that will never come to – and this is, like, me not thinking about the parents but thinking about the state. These are all investments that uh tax dollars that were wasted because those kids died before they could become productive members of society so from the machines thinking that's a waste of money but that waste is offset by the amount of profit from the weapons industry so they won't hyper 
police it or like you yeah know, yeah because control it the different competing uh, so it's really like our society said a certain number of dead children in school is worth the amount of money we're making and that, for that's guns. across the board though think yeah. about uh car recalls mm-hmm. oh there's gonna be 150 cars yeah. that burn and there'll probably be kids in them let's see the math here's the lawsuit all right we're not doing the recall yeah. i was thinking about in um uh immigration so immigration uh you often it's um adults who immigrate to the U.S. from third world uh, or from countries that are not doing well. But those ad- those adults already got their full educations mm-hmm. in the, the countries, their home countries. And they were often the most ambitious or innovative or uh, wily members of their communities who were able to get out to come to the U.S. So the brain drain is part of what happens, but also the investment that those states made to create viable humans who are productive uh, is also was basically stolen by the U S so like the U S should be paying all of these countries for the full educational fee of Mm -hmm. an 18 year old immigrant coming here. They should pay 18 years of like back to that country for every year that person was in school there. Because they pay. Now they're contributing their labor here. Yeah, Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, if you're a physicist and you come here from Uzbekistan, dude, the US should pay Uzbekistan just straight up. Our government should pay them for that person's entire curricula vita up to this point. Or maybe pay their parents if their government wasn't what put them through school. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, uh, But I think this is a different way of shifting us out of thinking about we need to provide for our kids. And yeah, that is true currently. But like it shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't be that way. And, and, and for me, you know, to add on to that, it's that it should be shifting away from having our interpersonal relationships be determined by capital um, and like survival reasons. Yeah. We the- shouldn't be picking who we spend our life with based on. I need health insurance and I don't want to die. <laughs> yeah. That's fucking hunger games. Yeah. 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 Straight up. And, and that's what people don't realize is. Everyone wants to talk about the essence of a wedding and mm-hmm. what makes it so beautiful. Yeah. And so many times that's see-through and it's just a facade and it's yeah. just cosplay because the reality is there are other reasons why these people get together. Like yeah. the, p- the purest form of romance uh, comes under a uh, communist yes. government because it is a government where everything is provided for you already by the state. So the only reason that you need to talk to another person is because you, you want genuinely to. like and love them. Yeah. yeah. Whereas, um, and even dating now, you're like, so what do you do? Yeah. It's like one of the first questions. And it's like, oh, great. That seems like a winner because they're on a track where like mm-hmm. we could, if we mate, we can have stuff. Yeah. North Korea is where love really exists. <laughs> I don't know. What, I don't know what, not co-signing that one, but uh, I appreciate your time, gentlemen. <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't have all the answers. I just have all the questions. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, my friends, re- uh, return to office. Goldman Sachs. Oh, Jesus. Ooh. Yeah. So I think it's so funny. that So we were talking about this earlier, but. Uh, when we right when we ran into you, but Goldman Sachs tried to get everyone to come back to the office about a year ago. Uh, I'm losing track of time now, so maybe it was nine <laughs> months ago. And they were like, "All right, everyone's coming back to the office," and no, pretty much no one came in <laughs> on the day they were supposed to. And it was just a mockery. The newspapers were going wild, etc. Uh, <laughs> this is what happens. They got checked by their employees, and nobody yes. wanted to fucking go back. And then recently, they were were like, this time, for real, you have to come in. So people (laughs) come in, and they test for COVID, and everybody was getting COVID. (laughs) COVID. COVID. So what's the response from Goldman Sachs? We're no longer testing for COVID. Oh, shit. Yeah, which boggles the mind. I mean, who else? Who better to do it than Goldman Sachs? Like. The most notorious as a shitball organization you can get. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they're all garbage. Like Wells Fargo, probably worse than Goldman Sachs. But let's be honest. This is just a blueprint for the other financial firms to leverage. Well, Goldman went back. We're going back. Yeah. And um, and so what do they do? Well, you don't have COVID if you never tested positive for it. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's also why the government's not going to give us any more free tests. 
Yeah, that's that's great too, right? Um, what is the government's commitment now to protecting people in a public health crisis? Nothing. Mm-mm. They're well, we already did all that, so you got enough from us now. Don't be greedy. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> fucking, yeah. Here's your one cup of soupy water. Mm-hmm. Exactly. That's it. We gave you a soup and we gave you a test. But why did the Goldman Sachs guys want everybody to go back? Oh, that so if you watch that show, The Industry, there's an amazing, it's almost like prophetic. Yeah. They must have written it, obviously, before this happened. But uh, there's just a whole monologue from the tyrant at the office. You need to see the whites of other people's eyes when you're talking to them about these trades, et cetera. They talk about it as being a personal uh, business, but... The reality is it's they're real in estate. an office. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, what the it's fuck? It's real estate. It's real estate. Yeah, it that all, they can't get all. rid of, and they have to justify using to their boards. And um, it's also, I read this in the Harvard Business Review. I like, I read a lot about labor and behavior mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And uh, what I read about this return to office stuff is they pulled a bunch of offices, like corporate corporations around the country, and they found that it was a, like a generational divide thing where the older people in the offices they are not comfortable with like doing business online. They also come from a world where their entire social world was made at work. Yes. You know, so they don't get that younger people. I count us amongst the younger people. (laughs) Um, Both a are comfortable doing business online and B have separate lives from our jobs. So we are happy to be able to do more of our life. And these old guys just keep being like, no, you have to, we have to do face to face. We just how you build community. It's how you build it. <laughs> and it's like, no, dude, that's you feel like you need to get up from your desk at three PM and chat someone up every day, but we don't. Yeah, we and would it's like a to waste finish half an hour early. Yeah. It's a such exactly that's yeah. my fucking biggest pet peeve. Yeah. Is chatty Cathy's in the office who have no friends. They've cons- they're consumed by their job yeah. willingly because they just gave up in the mouth of the fucking snake. Like Years ago, you know, they're like <laughs> eyes rolled in the back yeah. of their head, and they're just like getting like they're, tossed they're John Voight in Anaconda, <laughs> yeah. getting regurgitated out by the snake, and Absolutely. they eat again. Absolutely, yeah. and they're and that's who they are, and that's all they care about. So it's so that, and it's also they love to talk about it as community, or this is like how we yeah. facilitate business, company the culture. Reality <laughs> is them wanting control, and middle managers love to go check in on someone mm-hmm. and crack the whip on them for not. Uh, being posturing 100% of the time that they're fucking yeah. doing something. Like, if something takes eight minutes to do, you shouldn't have to fake that you're doing it for eight hours yeah. for the sake of keeping up, whatever. Do it for eight minutes and then get on with your life. And then go do laundry. Yeah, literally. Yeah. <laughs> and they just can't stand that. It's like, if your desired output is X and I'm getting it done way the fuck faster, let me do other things with my time. I'm not, yeah. you know? And, um, but yeah, I think it's just, it, is the machine that's going to crush everyone. Because if everyone thinks that COVID is the last of the plagues that are going to befall us, then they're out of their damn mind. It's something that is just a loser's proposition. Something else is going to come along. And then, so why put equity into getting people back into the space? Why run back into the trad prison of office spaces when we're now liberated from it? Ladies and gentlemen, uh, that is, that's it. That's the time we've got today for Halal Cartels. Uh, our guest, Luisa Diaz, do you have anything you want to plug? Um, yeah, sure. We're kind of taking a break right now, but um, there are plenty of old episodes of Why You Mad up, and we're probably going to come back in the next month or so. So check that out, Why You Mad pod on all the places you get podcasts. Yeah, and oh, I, it, I love it. I can't get enough. Yeah. I listen to it every week. Oh, so. and I guess, uh, yeah, also follow me on Twitter, Luisa Diaz Nuts. And <laughs> I have a monthly show hosted by Gary Goldman in Brooklyn. So if you like stand up, check it out. Hell yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, uh, Luisa, that was so great. I'm looking forward to having you back. I mean, that time evaporated. It was so fast. And I hope the list, let, let us know what you think. Definitely follow Luisa. Make sure to like, subscribe, comment, and rate us on Apple Podcasts. And like we always say, every episode, we love to know that you're listening. So many people DM me and text me when they're listening to an episode. Feel free to screenshot it, post it on your stories or your reels or whatever you uh, whatever you want, and even comment on it. You could um, you could put a video 
of what you're listening to up and then maybe uh, leave a review via your reels. And if you're like a Facebook junkie, like you can't get enough of Facebook and that's where you live, <laughs> your virtual life, uh, I respect that. I'm not knocking it. And one thing you can do is definitely post our podcast in any of the groups that you are part of. Uh, sex party groups, uh, pet groups, <laughs> yes. uh, trauma groups, anti-vax groups. We don't care. <laughs> Put it anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Marriage planning groups. <laughs> We'd love that. Uh, so anyway, I'm Gabe Pacheco. Thank you so much for listening. You can find me at Gabe Pack One on Instagram, and uh, come check Samir and I out at Funhouse Comedy Live every Wednesday at 10 p.m. at Pete's Candy Store. Now, guiding us out of this episode, the smooth, serene sounds of Serene Patel. Brand privilege. Peace. Peace.